Um, yeah, so some of you have started taking the poll. Appreciate that. For those of you who have not, let's go ahead and take the poll. Just want to get a sense of, uh, you know, some uh, some sense of how many of you use documentation. If you don't know what I'm talking about, clearly it's a no. I was it was kind of uh, <laughs> contemplating if I should put a maybe, and then I said no. If they don't use it, then it's it's clearly a no. So it's either a yes or a no. We have around 16 to. 20, 25 people here. There are 11 of you who have taken it. Appreciate it. This should be pretty uh, seamless. We will get to the next slide when I see maybe we cross that 15 or 20 mark. We can, or let's do 17 at least. Okay, quite a few of you use documentation here. That makes sense. Come on, we can do this. A couple more. Okay, and I promise we only have three questions. Sometimes I have question fatigue when I do this. Uh, I'm not going to fatigue you guys. So, all right, so quite a few of you, substantial portion of you do use documentation here. Uh, the next question that I had for uh, the group, if my clicker would work, is what about uh, in terms of uh, some of the fit pitfalls that you've you are having in terms of using templates. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just say, I don't know. But I'm curious if you've used templates and um, some of the pitfalls you've experienced with templates. And I just want to get a gauge from um, the room in terms of your familiarity with templates, why we use them, things like that, and then we'll get started. OK, very good. So some of you don't know what I'm talking about. We'll go into that. Well, um, if you do know uh, templates, just give me your experience in terms of what templates you use. Do you find them useful? Just uh, your thoughts about templates. And even maybe what does templates mean to you? That might be a better question than your experience. If, because clearly some of you have not. And it's, it's a typing in question, so it's going to take a couple minutes. But let's go ahead and get that in. Okay, very good. So some of you think it's complex. That makes sense. Uh, markdowns not flexible enough. They're not maintained. That's a good tip there. Um, I am curious about uh, whoever mentioned about markdown. Uh, do you feel like uh, is it the way you're using your templates and getting it from markdown and you know just using that kind of word word template? Okay, that makes sense. Um, the extensibility of it, the complexity. Two more people are typing. We'll wait for them to stop. But some of this makes sense, right? It's tedious. It's um, you know, it's kind of cumbersome, things like that. Um, this particular topic that I am touching on today, um, we went backwards. Give me one second to get my bearings here. Okay, cool. So um, this is the topic we're going to touch on today. Um, my name is Aparna Sundar. Like you mentioned, I'm a senior researcher at Open Search Project. Uh, I help quite a few teams. In, uh, open Search is an open source product. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, we have search and analytics stacks built in that, and that's how our users use them. I do help the community quite a bit in what they do, but I also, today's talk is more about the UX and about how I help designers with their research and things like that, and some of the templates and documentations there as well. And since I'm part of Open Search, we are an open source project, like I mentioned, and the views today are all my own, uh, and they guess they, I work for them, and I'm here. Um, representing some of the things we do um, in our uh, process, in our design process today. All right, so some of the things I want to cover today is why templates, why it makes sense to use templates, value of documentation from a research and design perspective, and then also talk about some of our examples. I'll walk you through what we did here. It's kind of a neat space. Um, worked in collaboration with one of our designers. I'll kind of feature her um, at some point. And then she and I together kind of uh, threw these templates out there for the community. So we'll share that resource with you as well. And hopefully this is kind of a little bit different from the streamlined templates that you're used to with Markdown and things like that. This is more geared for that design process. All right. Um, all right, I think there is a range aspect with this. Okay, so to start off, why templates? Um, we'll just look at it from the UX process, um, from um, you know our design process per se. When you look at our UX process, we have a lot of design that we do on the product. When it comes to utility things like you know for the admin things like that, we also do a lot of work on the front end in terms of dashboards. And the way Open Search is used by our customers is they might sometimes use our query, and they might use our analytics set of uh, tools, but then build their own front end. So build their own dashboards. They may use our dashboards, and they may use their own kind of custom solutions. So this kind of is helpful for those individuals who are 
basing um, kind of their solutions on our um, uh, tools, but then creating their own custom UX process per se. So since our designers go through that process of enhancing UX, it's kind of helpful to put this out to the community in case they're creating a solution um, uh, for their particular, you know, whatever their service they're offering. So, so the way our UX process works, we engage a lot of our trio teams uh, through the f feature implementation process. This is the classical process. We get these requirements. Either these are um, you know, issues on GitHub or they are determined as feature sets by the PM, things like that. Most of you might be familiar with the process. We go through iterative design. Sometimes we'll get the trio teams, we'll get other individuals, other folks from the community in terms of um, uh, in, you will do this even in community meetings. I've sometimes done this even in conferences, like in, in a session like this. We'll ask the community what they think, things like that, and get feedback on the design per se. And then we actually launch the product, right? And sometimes there's an experimental feature. Sometimes we'll actually launch that product. So it's a classic, typical kind of UX development uh, 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 kind of process that we follow. In terms of wondering why these templates are useful, um, first and foremost, some of the um, challenges are creating in that design process, some of the steps in that UX process, some of the steps can be very time consumer. And then the other thing is the process is um, kind of highly structured. Right? We're going to go through the same process. We don't know what the outcome is, but in terms of the process itself, it kind of can be very structured. And then it provides a checklist for workshopping. So we don't know what the UX solution would be. We don't know what the creative solution would be, but we know what the process would be, who the players are who to engage in that particular process. The other uh, benefit of kind of using uh, templates are it allows for creative problem solving because creative, like you can get into a, you can get into creative patterns for problem solving. Whether you're adding things, you're um, enhancing, enhancing things, or you're creating net new experiences for the customer. So for designers, some of the kits that are available out there for high fidelity templates, these are just related to the UX mocks and things like that. You have Ketopia, PSD UI kits, Android UI kits. You can kind of look up these um, different templates that are out there. You have a ton of sketch templates. There's also Figma templates out there if you um, are part of And it's all open source. So you can go out there and kind of get these templates for your particular UX process. So some of the benefits are obviously it is uh, it optimizes for known processes, right? So you don't have to start innovating and building um, the entire process net new. And the other thing um, to watch out for is this the substitute for some of the um, creative process, like I mentioned earlier. It just reduces the mundane tasks when things are tedious in your design process. So when you think about documentation, uh, we know that research is useful for our designers. Remember I mentioned that UX process earlier. When you think about the research process that goes through in this, um, you know, in the ideation process, research is used at each and every step of that ideation process. If you think about the very onset of a proposal when we start creating issues, things like that, you have a lot of research which are exploratory. Um, these are more like you don't know what the solution is. You don't know what kind of features your customer wants. You don't know who you're designing for, especially for high, uh, for customers, we call them low code customers. So customers who are highly dependent on that UX process, uh, we don't understand who that persona might be or what the jobs to be done. What is it they're trying to accomplish when you put them through that particular UX process per se. So the, all that comes at the onset of setting up our requirements. We'll do things like mental maps, mind maps. Um, segmentation is really a good tool in terms of understanding how the product is used. For example, since we're doing open search, if you think about open search dashboards, somebody might use it for observability. Others might use it for metrics or for traces or for um, you know different logs or different kinds of use cases. And so getting those uh, particular segments and mind mapping, all this is at the onset of the project. We don't know what our solution is right now. We're only getting requirements at this particular stage. 
Then we have the iterative design. This is when we actually put out mocks, vet it out with the users, see if it makes sense. And we're moving at very high velocity at this particular stage. So this is why those templates become really important. So things like user testing, if you're doing anything on user Zoom, things like that, like click, click tests, heat maps, information architecture, or any kind of, if you have new jargon you're putting into your UX, the customers may not know it, or they may be using different wordings, things like that. All this you can vet out in that sense iterative process of um, ideation. And this is all being vetted out with the user per se. And then finally, post-launch in tool surveys, putting your thumbs up, thumbs down, does this work? Or like what's working, what's not working, things like that. Again, you can do net new usability study for the entire workflow and sort of uh, microflows, and then any kind of accessibility studies, UX health metrics, things like that. All right, so if you think about it, when you use in the, in the design process, when you use templates and the documentation you start creating, you have this flexibility, that structure that the research and templates provides the designers, allows the designers to be truly innovative. And keep in mind, um, I think I, yeah, so yeah, this is the one. Uh, so some of the limitations for designers themselves, most, and I'm a designer, past life designer that, and now in research, and so um, some of the li limitations for designers themselves is they are moving at high velocity. They are trying to be as creative as they can in terms of solutionizing with their figmas, in terms of any kind of visual aids and, and things like that. So their mind space is with the visual design components of things. And so um, um, designers are um, kind of trained in that visual UI, UX um, you know, um, um, any kind of information architecture, things like that. But then how do you give them that valid research and how do you give them um, that valid uh, kind of footing on which they can base their particular design uh, decisions? And this is where researchers come in. They're kind of trained in methodologies. They're trained in providing that kind of foundation for the design work to take place. The other thing is um, designers need to balance. There's, it's, a, it's a very complex environment when you're designing with cross-functional partners, with developers, with your PMs, things like that. And so they are um, you know, kind of looking out for a lot of logistics of how to launch these products. And so by providing these templates and things like that, it's more structured for them to know that they follow that design process um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a kind of purest sense. And then there's also a lot of demands on designers. Their time goes into creative ideation. And so by providing um, uh, these templates, and designers do, do a lot of research themselves with the user, by providing these templates, it kind of helps them um, connect with the needs of the community um, you know, and kind of um, uh, any other specialized tooling that they require. Okay, so I'm just going to give you an example of what we did. And this is one I wanted to actually share with you guys today. So in this particular situation, I had a designer. Her name is Zinia. I'm going to feature her in a couple of minutes. So she, uh, we've, we've uh, in the past, for larger workflows by user, we have done usability studies. We'll get third-party vendors to kind of do a complete test of, the, of that particular persona's flow. And they'll kind of like, you know, give us the flaws, what works, what doesn't work. Usually, projects the designers undertake have a microflow. It's a smaller flow that they're working with, right? Instead of waiting for like a few months for that particular process to stabilize or that particular experience to stabilize with the user and do a usability study, there's a way to do it immediately. And so here we had a, a microflow. New York wanted to develop a microflow and test it as they were going. We had existing processes. We had vendor done research. I've done tons of research for them. We had all the know-how for usability, and especially for those personas that we had actually, we knew how different metrics in that experience should work out. So that was already there. So the existing process was there. And then the designer uh, initiated, uh, they wanted to create templates for not just themselves, they wanted to do this so that they can do this over and over again and also scale and share with the community as well. So um, the goal here was to share with the community. This is Zinia. She's our designer. Um, she does a lot of different kind of designing for uh, open search. Um, alerting. Right now she's on the security um, kind of, uh, it's a net new experience within open search. So she's done this. And so in, in context of this, we went ahead and created these templates. So our approach was um, kind of we have a workshop session. So it's 
I know how to do the research, right? But I'm working with my designers and I want them to do the research and we want them to do it at very high velocity, which becomes really challenging them. So the process I adopted was obviously to workshop with them, understand the, uh, you know, understand the different kind of flows they're working with, understand the different kind of outcome metrics in each of these microflows, um, share past examples and also train the designer. Again, designers are not trained, typically they're trained more for the um, visual component of it, so actually train them through some of the methodologies, usage of tools, um, if you're using any kind of statistics in some of the decisions we're making, how do we do that, so on and so forth. Um, and then of course, coaching, use a lot of office hours for this, I use user Zoom, that's what OpenSearch does, uh, we use user Zoom for our um, for some of the experiences we want to wet out, we actually put this out to the community as well, and that's a good source of kind of feedback for us in some of these experiences. And then let the designer drive the process so they can course correct. One of the benefits the designers drive is if there's any mock changes, they can immediately go in and switch it out. We don't have to have a complex meeting thing set. So that works out pretty good. And then um, the designer did create the template, we socialize the template, and then we use it and reuse it within our org, and then now we've put it up um, on Figma. So if you sign into Figma, you can actually see these templates for users. And um, I think, all right, cool. And then, um, so this is actually how it'll look. We have our open search on Figma. Um, and then you'll get that entire toolkit. You can actually download this particular toolkit. And this toolkit comprises of, because this is usability, right? We have, other, we have other templates for research up there as well. Today I'm just talking about the usability one. So if you're doing something like task completion, that's essentially what usability is. Can people do what we're trying to have them do? Like depending on their particular motivation in their workflow, are they able to accomplish what they're doing? So things like task completion, time on task, these templates are available there. Any kind of screener question, so for example, if you have a query or a search user and they're not interested in log analytics, you don't wanna have them, right? So you put down all your screener questions so you can screen them out, company size perhaps, based on the solution that they're using, open search for, so on and so forth. You can have your screener questions to say if they're qualified or not, and you can kind of code this into user zoom as well. And any kind of initial questions that kind of gives you some context on um, you know, what the user feedback was, like how many years of experience in open source, do you use other tooling, um, or what do you use this particular tool in conjunction, those kinds of questions there. And then we give them examples, obviously, of, you know, what the potential questions can be, and then um, also work through how we can display these um, solutions or display these findings with our teams. So for example, the task, the objectives, the scenario, any kind of success criteria taken into uh, question and then also assets. Now if individuals need to add more tasks, they can go ahead and add that. There's this little demo here that I have in terms of how um, they can actually modify the particular template and then we put all this into that template that's up on Figma. We did blog about this, so you can see this on opensearch.org um, if you go into that. Both of us wrote about how people can use that, so that's a resource for you as well. We've hosted this on YouTube as well, and I'm hoping this will, yeah. So this one is an example of how they can use it. This is in Figma, so if you download that particular template, you can go in, you can modify based on your particular use case, and use this in conjunction for or with any design mocks that you're using with your team per se. So this is kind of um, how the whole uh, file looks on Figma. It's kind of embedded in there. So as you can see, you have the tasks, the questionnaires, um, any kind of, um, you know, tracking the study, and then your final usability report as well. So the team can make any kind of decisions on the fly, and it enables that quick, rapid, um, you know, prototyping and moving through the study. Um, any other kinds of uh, details that you need to put in there, it's all very editable out there as well. All right, and to summarize here, some of the benefits to the open source community here are obviously by having that check in place and doing it in tandem with the design process, you have a quality control. It helps with automating some of your design processes. There are a lot of things that can become really complex, especially if you're adding new users or new jobs to be done and things like that, but for known 
kind of you know problems like incremental innovation it really automates the process and this works in conjunction with testing tools so it's kind of useful um, it saves time because you're not starting to do boutique you know custom research for each and every um, um, you know each and every microflow that you need to do you kind of know what you're um, testing you automate it and then it's easy to kind of um, do those testings and then um, there's also, you know, this is a this is the way in which we can train, um, you know, help train on how to implement research in your design decisions. And also, there's a lot of credibility in team. It reduces your risk and things like that. Here are some of the resources. These slides are up on Open Search on GitHub. So we do have um, a under community. If you go in there, you can actually get these slides there. Here are some more resources for you. That blog I talked to you about is on opensearch.org. It's called Using Documentation for Usability Studies, which is also I think, the topic of this particular session. And then that Figma template I mentioned to you, it's up on Figma. It's open source, so you can go in there, download it if it's useful for you. And then there's also a helpful YouTube video where the designer walks you through how to use the particular template and things like that. All right, there is a QR code there. This is not a question, but if you do want to connect with me, I'm, you can kind of follow that QR code up there. I'm open to conversations on LinkedIn or Twitter, or even if you're in OpenSearchCon, we are having an OpenSearchCon in Bangalore uh, next month and then in San Francisco in a couple uh, months. So if you have, you know, you're interested in coming and talking in OpenSearchCon, please feel free to uh, put your submissions in. We just got done with the Berlin OpenSearchCon. So yeah, happy to continue, uh, continue the conversations in any of those formats there. And one last QR code for you guys. I don't believe we'll see the uh, results of this, but if you had any feedback for me, feel free to do that. And with that, I'm open for questions as well. Thank you.